Welcome to the Fishing Daily Podcast, sponsored this month by Saltwater Marketing, digital marketing services for the commercial marine industry. Here's your host, editor of the Fishing Daily, Oliver McBride. Welcome back to the Fishing Daily Podcast. Uh, for our second season, we have a new theme tune, and it is from a band called Under Thousands, and it is their single, A Crazy App. And we'd very much like to thank the guys for uh, giving us use of this tune. Now, today I'll be speaking to Jens Christian Holz, who's a marine scientist from Norway. And we're talking about his hypothesis on overgrazing and predation. Welcome, Jens. Thank you. Jens, uh, you've been a marine scientist for a long time. When did you start out? And well, that's, that's a very long time ago. Um, I started out as a fisherman, actually, um, after high school, because that's what I really wanted to be. Uh, that must have been in 79. Um, and I worked as a fisherman for, for some years. Uh, then I realized that, um, well, I wanted to be more working on the scientific sides of, uh, of the ocean. So I started studying and uh, well, I, I finished my PhD in, uh, yeah, in the mid nineties. Uh, and then I started working at the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. And I, I worked there for, for many years in uh, 2000 and 2013. I, uh, quitted that job and then I've been working private since then. And in your time working with the Marine Institute in Norway, you did you cover a lot of range of a wide range of fish? Well, I started uh, working on uh, herring, the Norwegian spring spawning herring. That's the large herring stock uh, in the, the largest herring stock in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, I worked on management of that stock and also towards mackerel and uh, blue whiting and the big uh, pelagic stocks in the Norwegian Sea and well, west of Ireland and these areas. Um, so that was uh, my main uh, subject. And I, in 1991, uh, we did a catch of uh, post mold salmon together with mackerel and uh, herring up in the Norwegian Sea. And that caught my interest to, to study more the ecology and the, the relation between these different uh, species. I realized that catching small salmon in the same hole as loads of uh, mackerel that was a significant finding and uh, from then on I, I started working quite a bit on uh, salmon at sea in particular the life and ecology of the, the young salmon the post molds um, then around yeah uh, 2008 9 I, I quit the, the the pure management side of the the herring and and the pelagic fishes and I started working more ecosystem based to try to understand the relation between these uh, species out there I, I also worked quite a bit on on sea lice and uh, uh, looking at sea lice as a factor regulating the the size of uh, of uh, salmon stocks in Norwegian fjords. You know, they pass, uh, the, the smolts pass out through the fjords uh, and, and then you have all the fish farms producing sea lice, etc. So I worked for, uh, on that in parallel with these other things for, for quite some years as well. And during your time, did you see changes and in, in stock, fish stocks happening? Yeah, we saw <laughs> this. Uh, going, I went a lot on surveys in the Norwegian Sea, and there was one thing I learned that uh, when you come out the next year, the only thing you knew before uh, you came out was that things would have changed. You never experienced the same thing from year to year. But what we saw was that um, the, the herring stock was growing 
a lot oh, through the 1990s. You know, you had that major um, stock collapse in the 1960s, and in 1970, that stock was more or less completely gone, uh, depleted. That was a mixed effect of uh, too high fisheries and physical uh, temperature conditions in the ocean. But then it started growing again, and by the 1990s, uh, it had reached quite a big size. And towards the end of yeah, around 2008, 2010, that uh, stock was really at its height. And at that time, we could see the the amount of food in the ocean, the, the plankton uh, coming uh, strongly down. So the, the growth of the herring uh, decreased a lot. Simply, there was, there was too much in my view. And, and uh, what I, well, according to my results, there were actually more herring in the ocean than we estimated. We were not able to estimate the real size of uh, the herring stock. So uh, that became a bit a difficult thing. Uh, I had the view that we did not estimate these things accurate enough. We underestimated the herring stock very much. Uh, the high grazing led to lower uh, food concentrations, plankton, etc. Uh, also small fish uh, they would eat. Um, and that uh, would affect the post molts, uh, as I could see it, because the post molts started uh, growing, uh, the, the small salmon, let's see, started growing uh, much less than it used to do. So, so you got the hard competition there from first uh, herring around uh, 2010 and then that period, and then the herring stood stock started going down and uh, uh, at the same time the macro stock started increasing from around 2007 and that was really growing and got bigger and bigger and it, it spread really throughout the North Atlantic from it went to Greenland to East Greenland, Western Iceland, Jan Main Island, Spitsbergen, they fished quite a bit of macro on the keys in uh, Longyearton and uh, so it was in a way all over. It was uh, all the way from Biscay up to Longyearton. And, um, and that enormous spread we saw of the, of the macro stock, that was a very good indicator that this stock must be many times bigger than the official numbers. The, it did that great migration simply to find food. So it was in a way forced to to migrate further and further uh, west and north in order to find food. And all this led to a hard competition with the young salmon, which in my view simply depleted the, the salmon stocks. Uh, and we saw the salmon in, in Ireland, in uh, Scotland, England, Norway, everywhere, just plummeting uh, towards very, very, low levels compared to what we had seen in the early 1970s when, uh, as I said earlier, the herring was out of the ocean, the mackerel was heavily fished and was more or less uh, out. So in 1973, I would say the, the young postmolts, the young salmon came out in this uh, big feeding area almost alone with no uh, competition. It had a tremendous growth and you, it was fished hard everywhere from Greenland to the Faroes in the Norwegian Sea, long, uh, you know, long liners and uh, drift nets along all coasts and different uh, fishing gears uh, along the coast and the sea locks and the fjords. And even in the rivers, there were great fishing in those days. And that was like the, the top of that cycle. And then it bottomed out maybe around 2008 or 2010 in that period. Uh, but the, the salmon stocks are still not up. 
but there are signs today that there is less predation. The mackerel has started growing better in terms of individual growth. Uh, the salmon has started growing better in terms of individual growth. And when we see the size of the grills coming back to what it used to be, then we will also see uh, more normalized size of uh, the returns, the runs of, uh, of salmon. Who thinks that your hypothesis did, going back on what you said there, was the size of the fish themselves, the mackerel or the herring, if there's a, if there's a lot of them in it, they, they get smaller? Yeah, of feeding. course, uh, it was not only the, the, um, the salmon that decreased in size at age, or uh, it was also the, the herring and the mackerel. And um, yeah, in, in about uh, 10 years time, the, the weight of uh, seven years mackerel was almost halved from uh, 2007, 8 till 2016. So they were starving as well. So it was not only the, um, the, the salmon starving or the postmod starving. This uh, led to starvation for a lot of species. And if you look at the seabirds, like uh, kitty wakes and puffins and those uh, seabirds, depending on, um, on uh, plankton and small fish, they have collapsed all the way from, I don't know really about Ireland, but at least from Scotland and northwards along all the coasts. And if you look at the uh, gannets who, who live from, uh, <laughs> from pelagic fishes eating uh, mackerel and herring and, and postmods, they have just exploded. So if you look at the seabird colonies in these areas, there's been a tremendous shift from uh, the plankton eating uh, seabirds into those eating larger fish, which uh, the gannet is the best example of. So this is, this is very systematic, uh, this tremendous ecologic shift we've seen uh, during this period of uh, far too high abundance of the pelagic fishes, in my view. Outside of the macro and you know the maybe other factors, there's a lot of talk about sea lice being a problem. And now you you said you stud yourself you studied sea lice. How much an impact does sea lice have on salmon or salmon smolts? More more so. Yeah, I <coughs> well I I, I call. The sea lice, the, the sea lice hypothesis. That's an hypothesis, just like what I have forwarded. This uh, the hypothesis on uh, overgrazing and uh, predation. Um, I said I worked um, quite a lot of uh, uh, quite a lot on sea lice on outward migrating smolts in Norway from 1998 and up till about 2005. And during those first years, and in particular 2000 and 2001, we found, I would say, very, very high infections on the outward migrating smolts in Norway. And at that time, I was, I was really certain, or based on our observations, that the, um, the sea lice was a very serious uh, problem for uh, the salmon. Then the fish farmers started treating their fish in a much better way in terms of delicing. And the numbers of sea lice released into the fjords decreased uh, strongly. Um, and based on different results, uh, independent data from other places, uh, in my view, uh, at least after 2000, uh, around 2002, there was no reason to claim that sea lice was uh, a regulating factor for the for the salmon anymore in Norway. And uh, 
one argument for this is, of course, if you look at Eastern Scotland and the salmon stocks in Eastern Scotland, where there are no uh, salmon farms whatsoever. So I would say they are unaffected by uh, sea lice from, uh, from uh, salmon farms. And if you look on at the development of the salmon stocks in eastern Scotland and compare those to the Norwegian salmon stocks, you will see that the development in Scot eastern Scotland is much more severe than it's been in Norway. Uh, that's just an indirect uh, indicator, uh, as I see it. There's also several other uh, time series showing quite cl clearly, in my view, that today the sea lice has I would say hardly any regular. It's, it's not hardly any regulating factor for the returns of salmon, uh, and the returns of salmon, as I see it, they will come back the moment the predation from mackerel and herring has been lowered to what we can call more normal levels. When those stocks are back down at the sustainable ecologic level, then we will see uh, further growth, uh, individual growth in the grills. So you, you like in, in Ireland, you will see a bigger grills coming back. It will come back earlier and it will come back in larger numbers. And I expect that um, development to, I think it may have started happening, but I think it will be stronger in the years to come. But this depends on that uh, the macro stock is kept at the sustainable ecologic level. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's there yet. It has to be reduced still more. Uh, and that may happen simply through natural processes, but I'm not really sure about that. Is, is climate change and ocean temperature changes, is, is that affecting salmon? Yeah, of course, the, the, the temperatures affects uh, both salmon and all these fishes, but as I see it, the the temperatures in the main feeding areas of the European postmolds in the Norwegian Sea is down at normal temperatures uh, aligned with the long term normal, according to the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. So, so there is no temperature effect in those feeding areas today. So I think it's, it's very, well, at least to me, it's hard to find that temperatures are a major factor in this uh, collapse we've seen uh, of, the, of the salmon stocks. You know, like in, in a country like Ireland, where like we've got a lot of salmon rivers, they're not very big salmon rivers, but you know, they're, they're, they're a, we're a very, very valuable uh, source for a place for salmon going breeding. Is mm. there anything that says that like climate change is affecting the smolts leaving the rivers? Are we seeing less smolts leaving the rivers as a result of maybe the climate? being warmer here in, in, in Ireland mm. all year round rather than having like the cold winters that we used to have. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on, on the river systems, I have to say that, so I'm going to be careful in this, but I know they've seen effects of warmer rivers and um, of course if you have major changes in winter temperatures that may be unfortunate. So, so I think the, the point here would be to, well, at least have some index rivers or where you know approximately how much is going out. So, you, so at least you know that you still have uh, the necessary uh, smoke production out of the rivers. Uh, of course, the, the, the salmon is affected by loads of different factors uh, from temperatures in the rivers, uh, hydro, power stations, uh, farming, um, I mean, sand, uh, taking out sands from river bottoms, et cetera, et cetera. So the, uh, it's as important that the, the rivers work well 
as uh, that the that the ocean work well in in ecologic terms for for the salmon. So the life of a salmon is a very delicate balance. It leaves the river, it heads out to sea. So your studies are when it gets out into the open ocean. What's it like for what like where do they go? What happens to them when when they're right there? Yeah, if we let's take a <laughs> if we take a smoke from the river just outside where you live, that that has a, quite a short uh, journey out to the open ocean, so that um, that will not take very long time. Um, it will uh, normally they will swim in fairly small schools, uh, maybe five ten up to 30 fishes and they have some remarkable ability to to find their way um, northwards they they use uh, this strong current that goes along northwards along the shelf edge called the the shelf edge current so they migrate in a very um, concentrated band northwards uh, and they, their, their goal is these uh, feeding areas in the ocean between yeah, the Faroes, Iceland, uh, Jan Main Island, uh, Spitsberg and Bear Island and, and Norway. A lot of the post molds will end up in, in that area. Uh, it's called, uh, well, the largest area there is called the Norwegian Sea. And, um, on that uh, migration north, they are joined by the mackerel because the mackerel spawns, uh, yeah, it spawns from uh, uh, Bay of Biscay uh, outside uh, Ireland, Scotland and northwards towards the Faroes. So because of uh, this huge uh, spawning or mackerel stock we have at the moment, uh, the, the post molts from Ireland will swim together with the, the mackerel uh, northwards. And uh, we had these surveys uh, around uh, 2000 and some years after, where we went out and waited in the, or we, we trawled for the smolts in the international zone in the Norwegian Sea. And uh, we knew approximately the exact date when they would arrive there. There was very little variation between the years. So we were, we hit them and then we followed them and, and caught the, the post molds in mix with quite a lot of, uh, of mackerel. So they were swimming in exactly the same waters and then uh, they distribute uh, out uh, almost like a, <laughs> what you call it, a, uh, a fountain or a volcano out into that big feeding area up north. Uh, and then they stay there for the first summer to, to feed. And uh, after the summer feeding, uh, they start contracting and will then go southwards towards the Faroes and, and stay in, uh, in some areas uh, there during the winter. And depending on their growth and on what river they come from, uh, whether that's a big uh, uh, multi-sea winter river where you have older, typically older fish coming back, uh, which you don't have much of in, in, uh, in Ireland. In Ireland, you have mainly grills rivers. So you could say that for, for the Irish rivers, they would uh, grow uh, up to a certain size. Uh, these days, the grills are quite small, while uh, earlier in the uh, 1970s, the, the grills were much smaller because there was so much more food in the ocean and much less uh, competition then. So um, then they would uh, migrate back uh, after that first winter and back into the, into the rivers to spawn. But today, as said, we, uh, that back migration is or the run of uh, uh, grills 
has just plummeted tremendous, uh, tremendously compared to earlier years when the competition in the ocean was much, much smaller. Like, there is a, there is a theory that you hypothesize, you're being proud of that uh, a macro could eat a post malt. So, what, what size are we talking that the macros? Uh, mackerel are and what size w are the po post moths when they reach the uh, their feeding areas? Yeah, um, I don't know exactly the size of the average Irish post moth. No, small. Uh, but in Norway, the Western Norway, the average size of uh, small is around twelve and a half to thirteen centimeters, and I, I guess the Irish smolt would be not very far from there. And um, a smolt at uh, 12, 13 centimeter, that's a prime um, feed for, for mackerel. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Norway, we've uh, taken some samples of mackerel, and what we see is that the mackerel will eat the young mackerel up to 40% its own length. And that means that the uh, mackerel at uh, 50 centimeters would eat the uh, post malt up to uh, 20 centimeters. And a post malt at 20 centimeters today, that means uh, that's a post malt that could be, uh, has been in the ocean for maybe two months. So that means that during most of that northward migration, uh, from Ireland and uh, through May and June, uh, the Irish post malt is a potential prey for uh, for big mackerel and mackerel in general. And then, of course, um, we have found mackerel, loads of mackerel in mackerel stomachs. We have not found scientifically found. Uh, smolts or post smolts in mackerel stomachs. But I have, there are two persons I know who have seen it. One fisherman who was fishing um, loads of mackerel outside the major salmon area in Norway, and they gutted the mackerel at sea. Uh, they found uh, frequently uh, 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 salmon smolts in the uh, in the stomachs of uh, the mackerel they were gutting they were selling readily ready gutted fish directly to the market so they just gutted the fish at sea and iced them in boxes and shipped them off the, the moment they came on shore so that's one observation and then i have one other observation from another person who actually filmed this but it's not possible to see the smolts being eaten, but it's possible to see the mackerel uh, attacking uh, smolts just outside a, a river in Norway. So, so of course, I'm very eager to have this documented that uh, actually the, um, the, the mackerel eat um, smolts or post smolts. So in terms of uh, size, uh, it's not a problem in terms of mackerel eating small mackerel. It's not a problem, and in terms of these observations I refer to, it's not a problem. It, it does happen, but it has to be scientifically proven, and that's been difficult to 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 do because my hypothesis is quite uh, uh, controversial and. I would say it's worked against by other scientists who, who don't agree with me. But that's how science is. There's, yes, as you're saying, there seems to be a resistance against your hypothesis. Um, would it be easy to research this? Or is, is, is it because it's difficult to, to prove it? Well, I think it would be easy to research it if you had the means uh, to do it. Uh, but uh, this hypothesis has been uh, controversial from day one when I presented it in uh, around 2010. 
um, because it goes against the, the ruling hypothesis of sea life and on, on uh, ocean climate. And then it's not so popular amongst other maybe senior scientists uh, in uh, the salmon uh, environment. Uh, so it has been a, a tough fight to, to, to get this done. I, I'm sure it will be done, but maybe some older scientists have to be retired first. We'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> I, I'm quite uh, optimistic about it. I've got plenty of time in this, but um, on behalf of the, the salmon and the, the, the wild salmon community, I, I would say it would be, be very nice to, to have these things tested. And also in terms of, uh, of the mackerel, those fishing mackerel, uh, because uh, we are not talking about removing the mackerel, we are talking about getting a better quality mackerel, getting back that big mackerel, about 600 grams, which is the best paid. That's hardly around these days, simply because the mackerel grows so slowly. So, so in my view, this is a, it's a win-win situation, both for the mackerel fishermen and those interested in the interested in the wild salmon to come back. How much do you think current find is underestimating the size of the mackerel stock in the Northeast Atlantic? Well, <clears throat> if we look at the size of the feeding area of the mackerel at its highest abundance some years ago, I would say that that stock could very well be four to five times bigger than the, the official numbers. Um, and if you talk with professional fishermen, knowing these things quite well, I think many of them would agree with that. Uh, I've heard numbers like that mentioned by some uh, very senior fishermen that the stock is much bigger than it used to be. And, um, but of course, I have no proof of this. There are, though, data series used by the ISIS indicating that the stock is much uh, bigger than it is, but those data series are actively chosen away by the scientists. And they even write that in th their reports that this can't be right, so we can't use that result. And uh, to me, that's not the way we, we should deal with data and, and science. We should look at these different results and really try to follow them up with additional experiments, which I think is definitely possible to do if we really want to find out of it. Could a large mackerel stock have impacts on other fish outside of, um, say, like salmon that we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you look at a mackerel, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mini tuna. <laughs> it's a mini bluefin tuna. And they are really prime predators. A, a mackerel would eat anything from eggs of itself and other fishes uh, through the, the plankton, the very small plankton, the, the Calanus femarchicus, which is the major uh, planktonic species in the North Atlantic. Um, it's really the basis of uh, the, the animal uh, or the animal plankton. Um, then it would eat small fishes, it would eat uh, uh, fry from, uh, from any fishes, cod and saith and herring and uh, well, mackerel and uh, sprats or whatever, then it would eat, yeah, it would eat uh, adult uh, sprats. Uh, and I've seen myself uh, where I have a cottage in Norway in the fjord, there was quite a nice school of uh, sprats under a key, a floating key on a bay uh, where I had my boat lying. And there was a, a school of uh, mackerel in that bay. And that, uh, <laughs> that uh, school circulated in the bay. And every time it passed the, the, um, 
the Sprat School. It took a bite of it, and in a matter of ten days, that uh, Sprat School was uh, was gone. It was simply eaten away. And today, there is no uh, Sprats left in that uh, whole fjord whatsoever. There's been loads of mackerel, and they've simply been eating it out. And and what we are seeing on the Norwegian coast is that the large abundance of uh, mackerel during many years now has eaten out the recruitment of all these local stocks of uh, uh, cod and uh, yeah, all, all different local stocks have really decreased. Uh, both the food of those stocks are gone and their recruitment is gone because of this heavy uh, predation from mackerel. And, and that's been seen out throughout this uh, great feeding area of the mackerel stock during the later years. They've been eating out stock after stock of prey species for other species. And the example with the seabirds I mentioned earlier, that's maybe the, the very best example because we can see the seabirds. But all these big predation processes going on in the ocean, they are very difficult for us to see, while the seabirds collapsing, we can easily see, and the gannets just exploding in stock sizes, we can easily see. So everything going on in the ocean is more or less impossible for us to see. You really need to study these things over a long time series. You need to be really interested in and open to try to to see what's going on. Uh, a macro feeding frenzy on Sprat myself, and it went on for like two days and it just wiped out whatever Sprat that was in it. It was unbelievable. It was, <laughs> for me, it's one of those amazing moments in life when you see sort of like nature sort of like on overkill. It, it, was, it was crazy. I think that is maybe the case here, that people living close to the ocean, seeing these things, for those people, this is not very, this is, this is quite a plausible and believable hypothesis. But for a mathematical modeler or a land-based scientist, these things can be difficult to envisage and, and really believe is happening. But, but they are happening all the time. The, the force of predation is just immense. And we, we know this from, from land. Uh, we've heard the story about the, the wolves uh, in Yellowstones, which were hunted out, and how that affected the total uh, ecosystem there. Uh, and then they reintroduced the, the wolves and uh, the ecosystem started changing back. So, and we know this from deer stocks uh, on land. Uh, if a deer stock grows too large, then in Norway, we would typically hunt out maybe half a stock. And this applies to reindeer and elk and, or moose and, and all these other uh, land-based animals also. We would hunt out a lot of them to restore uh, more the, let's say, the, the natural ecosystem. While in the ocean, the management regime history is different. So that's one reason why this is controversial, that uh, the thought of catching a lot of mackerel to reduce its footprint, its ecologic footprint, that's not really what we do in uh, ocean uh, or fisheries management. That's not the way to do it. So, so that's a, a major reason why this is uh, controversial. Some of the marine scientists that has challenged your hypothesis state that, you know, that all these fish stocks coexisted in harmony at one time in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. Does, does that ring true or is there something that has caused an imbalance, do you think? No, they have never, uh, this, it's always been a changing uh, balance between these uh, stocks. And one of the main things that 
triggered my interest into this was uh, uh, David Summers from uh, Scotland. He uh, published uh, his PhD around 1993, uh, that time. And what he worked on, he looked at Eastern Scottish salmon rivers where they caught, they used uh, these uh, what, uh, like set nuts uh, in the estuaries um, where they caught large amounts of uh, running salmon coming back to the rivers. And they had data series on the ratio between grills and multi-sea winter salmon all the way back to I think 1740 in the longest time series. So in that time series, you could see how the ratio between grills, one sea winter fish and multi sea winter fish was changing over a very long time series. So in some periods, you had a lot of grills, meaning that the salmon the post molds had grown very well. They reached a high size or a big size early, and most of them came back as grills. So in some periods, long periods, we are talking periods of 80 years here, since 1740. In some periods, you had a good growth out in the ocean. And in other periods, the ratio of um, grills on um, multi-sea winter fishes dropped and there were more older fishes coming back, meaning there were less food for the post molds. So they had to grow another year or two or the two more years in the ocean. And if you then look at that relationship and see that in the period you got a lot of uh, grills back, well, there was a lot of food for the salmon, meaning that the pelagic stocks were probably, the, the herring and mackerel stocks were probably low during those times. So in my view, this is just part of a very long, long uh, dynamic rhythm in the ocean. But the difference between <laughs> 1740 and today is that during that period, man had no influence on this system. While well, we had started hunting the big whales and we had even already by then, uh, maybe severely uh, almost exterminated some species, but at least or, or the man's footprint was not very large. But today we are managing this system. We put, we measure the stocks, we set the quotas. So it's very much, much up to man today to manage this system. And to me, that's really the big challenge of the future. It is to have accurate um, estimates of these big uh, pelagic stock, the herring, the mackerel and the blue whiting but in particular the two first ones, to have accurate uh, and good uh, estimates of the stocks and uh, manage this in an ecosystem-based way where we balance the feeding from those stocks with their sizes. And what has happened in this case where we are today, I think we've come too far out of the range where we should have been the pelagic stock simply got too big. We shouldn't have gone that far. But the reason why we went that far was simply because we didn't uh, measure the stocks well enough, not accurate enough, we underestimated them. If we had had better methods to estimate them, we would have fished them harder and not, not let them become that big. And I think in the future that will be uh, the, um, the principles we will be working after. But this will take some time, but it will definitely come because the costs of what we are doing today is simply too large. Uh, when you have two big uh, pelagic stock over a long period, when they feed the Calanus femarcus stock, 
too low, and also the other uh, uh, plankton stocks too low. The phytoplankton, the, the plant plankton, is not grazed efficiently. There are too few grazers on the grass. And when there are too few grazers on the grass, the grass will die and it will fall down if it's on land. But in the ocean, the grass will sediment to the bottom. So what's happening today is simply that a lot of the grass is sinking out of the system rather than being grazed and going up into the ecosystem pyramid. So earlier, when there was a good balance between the plankton grazing on the plant plankton, uh, the amount was good. We had a large each ecosystem like that with a huge uh, productivity. When you take away uh, too much of the grazers on the grass, then the grazing gets too small and a lot of the uh, grass simply sinks out. And that means that the energy gathered from the sun in the phytoplankton, much of that energy is simply sedimented on the bottom of the seafloor rather than becoming plankton, becoming fish, becoming uh, tunas, becoming whales, becoming seabirds, becoming catch for, for man. So, so what we are doing uh, when we have two large stocks grazing on the plankton, like the macro stock today, is that we lower the total productivity of the ecosystem. And that is at a high cost for, for man at the end of the day, and to all these different species, and in particular salmon, as we are talking about now. Uh, because salmon has a special place in, in our hearts, or in, in man's uh, mind and heart, because it, it is in a way the, yeah, let's say it's the, um, the oceanic fish that we have the closest connection with, simply because it migrates into our living, uh, into our hoses, uh, so to say. Uh, no other fish is just that in a way. Maybe the sea trout, but uh, from the real big ocean, it's the salmon. I it's an amazing thing. Yes, it's it's baffling at times, and it's you know when you dig deep, deep into it, there is so much uh, uh, that's happening out there, and you know, it's just an ordinary person like myself here wouldn't would never think of all this all the things that's happening. Um, what, have you any projects that you're working on at the moment that you can tell us about? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm I've been fighting the. I quitted my job uh, at the Institute of Marine Research in I resigned personally uh, in 2013, uh, almost like a protest because uh, when I came up with these results that was not appreciated very much by the leadership and, and they started telling me what I had to do and they took away my, my, uh, my funding, uh, so I had uh, well, I felt they tried to get me into other things. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I have my own private uh, firm where I do some development and consultancy uh, in a firm called Ecosystem Based. Um, you know, when you have put your head ahead like I have, it's, it's not very popular and I've become a quite controversial person. But I'm, I'm living well with that and uh, I'm doing uh, some work, some private development work, uh, some small projects and I'm taking some uh, consultancy uh, projects from, from time to time. Well Jens, thank you for coming on the show. It's been very interesting learning about salmon and mackerel and herring and everything else that's happening out there in the deep blue that we don't often get to hear about and we'd like to have you back on the show sometime again maybe when you're working on another project that would be very nice thank you